Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's Friday, November 29th, 2013, and hopefully if you're lucky and you're here in the States, you have some time to sit back and reflect on what you're thankful of. You know, hopefully you're not thankful about the new PlayStation or the new Xbox. You're thankful about things that really matter in life. And one guy who is very happy just to be alive is Mario Lopez. He is a war veteran who was badly burned. Since returning to the States, Mario has become an ordained minister and also runs a very successful art gallery. He sat down with Gigi Arnetta to tell us more. Joining us live here in studio tonight is Mario Lopez. He's an army vet, a wonderful painter, and he also has a ministry called HowIKnow.org, and you can check that out. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice, nice to be here. So when did you decide you wanted to get into the military? Was it a family thing, or was it... Just something you had and you just wanted to go fight or what happened? After the seeing the Twin Towers fall, it moved me a lot. And uh, then uh, 2000, um, 2000, I guess, three we went in and uh, I was a senior then and, and uh, I was looking at my uh, computer teacher and just watching uh, all the troops go into Iraq. And um, and I was just like, I, I want to be there, you know, I need to be there for the atrocities that happened on September 11th. So you had knowingness. There was a knowingness that pulled you, is that what? Yes. Yeah. And so when you got there, were you wanting to do several tours or you when you got there, were you like, okay, this isn't really what I thought it would be? What well, was your perspective? No, uh, I, um, I was first a reservist and uh, I thought that I need to go active duty because I want to do this all the time. It was a lot of fun. So, uh, so I did in uh, 2005. And shortly after that, I uh, deployed to Iraq. And uh, then it was everything I hoped it would be. <laughs> it was a great mission, great command, uh, uh, great hours, great climate, um, uh, and just love what we were doing for the Iraqi people. I was there whenever they first started voting. Oh, how like, exciting. Yeah. All right. And uh, so I was just like, wow, you know, making a See difference. See freedom happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I thought we were um, spreading seeds of freedom, you know. Exactly. And uh, and then I came back home and I was trained, you know, for about a year and a half. Everything changed, you know, every, every command um, from the uh, squad leader all the way up to to the general changed and it was completely different as far as you know the command that was in charge everything was different and uh is that something you can talk about or is that yeah of? yeah i can talk about that i mean yeah i can talk about that for uh, people who might not understand that can you explain that statement oh uh yeah like uh the general uh that was in charge of our our missions changed all the way down to my squad leader, like the person who micromanages uh, me. You know, changed everything changed, and uh, standard operating procedures changed. Uh, um, uh, um, our mission changed, hours changed. I went to a different country. You know, just. Uh, Do you know why that happened? Oh well, because you were a different country, and uh, they had different standard operating procedures, but uh, it, in. Um, in Iraq, we didn't have anybody, uh, nobody lost their life in Iraq, except for one person who committed suicide. Um, but as far as, you know, um, engaging with the enemy, no one, no one died. So it's really a completely different mission as far as the, yeah. the ground. Tell us about what happened after the IED. Um, after the IED, I, uh, I got, um, flown to to uh, Germany and then from Germany got flown to Brook Army Medical in San Antonio and was uh, treated by the best doctors in the world and uh, they did a good job and uh, <clears throat> I, uh, some people say uh, well usually older folks who don't really care about what they say they're like you know are you gonna have any more surgeries and and I tell them no this is as good as it's gonna get okay? <laughs> 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 it's a lot worse before you know and uh, and, uh, yeah, so. Well, I want to talk a little bit about your testimony. But mm -hmm. first, I want to find out about that incredible arm you got there. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if our audience got to see it in, during the show, so oh, okay. you have a bionic arm. Yeah, it's a prosthetic. It, uh, I don't know what they call it, bionic, but I, I don't <laughs> know. I could be wrong. It looks pretty bionic. Yeah. It's uh, great technology. The Army is giving to one of the warriors. So. Do you um, do you train with that arm? They put you through a lot of PT. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it took me maybe about six months to get it down, and it's got um, uh, three functions: the elbow, uh, the um, the rotating the wrist, and then the hand to grab things like coffee mug or uh, keys or phone. <laughs> now, does it use your nerves or your muscles, or how does it, uses, it talk? It uses uh, my muscles in my um, in my arm because I still have a little remnant of my arm, just a little, uh, and it, um, it 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 reacts to the electrical impulses our muscles give, mm -hmm. and so I have my bicep and my tricep still. Okay. Um, still in there. So one one electrode's hooked up to my bicep, and one electrode's hooked up to my tricep. And then uh, I I rotate and use the elbow and everything. It's like I best I can best explain it as a uh, modes on a wristwatch, a digital wristwatch. You know, you can put it in different modes to do different functions. That's what this does. And uh, so I just get it to do whatever. Uh, did you have a tattoo on that arm? Yeah, it's a. Um, it's a oh, oh, there you go. It's wow. a just just something. The uh, the the people who do the skins just were like, come on, uh, get get something cool. Make this make this hard for us. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I'm I'm planning on doing speeches and presentations and business meetings. So so what do you have? It's beautiful. So it's um, it's like like Terminator type stuff. Mm-hmm. Your cy is it cyborgish yeah. arm there? Yeah. Yeah, I think cyborg, and I have a little bit up here, so so I can hide it and 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 make them happy, like because he. Um, because you are talking to people in the church a lot. Yes, yeah. yes. Me and my wife have a ministry. It's called HowIKnow.org. 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 How did you come to find the Lord? Were you always in the church, or tell us a little bit about? Uh, I I grew up in the church. Uh, my um, um, my parents had been going forever. Then my grandpa, my grandfather, uh, he has a church in San Diego, Texas, and uh, and so as I was growing up in my high school type years, uh, he we were in church in San Diego, and I'm from Alice, Texas, and and uh, we would um, we go to church in, in in you know my grandpa's church. So I grew up in the church. My mom's actually a minister there now, also, and and. Um, and so yeah, I've always been involved in the church, but I put my uh, Christianity to me was just something I did on Sunday. It wasn't it wasn't a part of my life until uh, I had some crazy supernatural experiences, and uh, as you can imagine, and um, <clears throat> and then um, after that, I decided that I wanted to get closer and I wanted to know more about about God and. About Jesus and and uh, I met my wife and her being an educator uh, kind of helped facilitate uh, uh, putting a presentation together and moving in that direction and uh, and so that's what we do now we uh, I talk I tell my testimony and uh, it's pretty powerful and uh, what supernatural experience happened <laughs> um, I believe in uh, 2009, mm -hmm. I uh, was uh, overdosing on, on my medication. I was taking too much and drinking at the same time. And uh, I, one particular night, I remember uh, feeling my heartbeat slow and my breath slow and uh, slow down. And I was I was thinking, wow, you could really die tonight. This could be the night. And um, and as I was talking to myself, I was like, well, if I die, I should go to heaven because after everything I've been through, after I've done all the sacrifices I made to my, to my country, 
I should go to heaven. But that was that was false because no good works will get you into heaven. It's it's you know trusting the Lord and. But so and, many people miss that. Yeah. They think that oh well I'm good at I did this for so and so I did I do this for the community I'm I done so much on this planet since you know God put me here so I should be okay and I they miss this, the message of grace right yeah and uh, so so I um, I uh, so what happened that made yeah, that I, transition for you where you well I actually visited hell yeah okay I actually visited hell I uh, he showed me um, okay uh, you're you're not gonna go to heaven. I mean, he didn't tell me this, but you know, I can put the pieces together. Uh, he said, "You're not gonna go to heaven. You're gonna go to this other place if you don't, you know, follow me and put me first. And your works cannot get you get you there. Yeah. So I'm gonna show you uh, um, what you'll be, you know, um, immersed in for all eternity if you don't, you know. And and I." Uh, I, I fell asleep, and uh, I, uh, I guess I came out of my body a little bit, and at this point my spirit was a like a smoke, mm -hmm. like if you blow out a candle mm -hmm. and you see the smoke rising, like that's what it looked like. Like I don't I else can I explain it. And then I started traveling down instead of up. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> you know that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Uh, and what did I mean? You're obviously not no longer in your body. So right. is there a feeling of where you, you yeah, trying to cling, feel... like trying not to go or anything, mm -hmm. or was it just no? I just I just like fall? popped out and then I started going down. Wow. And it just started going faster and faster, and then I saw an orange pinhole light, and and I got closer and closer, and then I could start. I could feel the heat, <laughs> and then uh, and next thing you know, I'm in the middle of hell. And uh, the first thing that I, that I felt was the hatred. The hatred was like a tangible thing. It was like a fog, you know? You know how you can go into a room and, and you can tell if people aren't happy with you? You, you, know, you can right. feel like, you know, you can cut it with a knife or something. You right, know? you know the presence of it is yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah. But this is time, a million times over. Like wow. this, okay. uh, <laughs> this uh, the hatred in hell is just, is just overwhelming. And... Uh, then the next thing I felt was uh, the heat. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously I've been on fire before on Earth, and uh, the heat there in hell is 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 a million times worse than it is on Earth. On Earth, um, it feels the way it looks. It like when you see a flame, mm -hmm. you know, like that's it that's where you, in it. Yeah. yeah, that's where you feel the pain. Uh, it, on earth it, it hurts here it hurts here it hurts here yeah. like little pops of pain here and there but in hell it feels like acid it feels like all over your body all at the same time completely consuming completely consuming not one inch of you is it gets a relief and then uh, then I felt uh, the hopelessness <laughs> and uh, I even remember accepting the hopelessness because I knew I deserved to be there and uh, like that story that Jesus told uh, about Lazarus, that uh, the, the rich man that went to hell, and right. you know, it was a parable, but it very well could have happened. Uh, and uh, uh, the rich man accepted it. He said, I, I will go and, and um, uh, just let me go and tell my brothers and my family not, not, to, not to come to this place. It's a horrible place. Uh, so... I had um, experienced, accept, you know, I accepted it, but the hopelessness there, I, I knew that there was nothing I could do, that I was gonna be there forever. And I knew that I had, I missed out. And so I'm feeling all these things and then I can see. And I, I peer out into um, the, um, into this room, uh, there was, I fell into a house with no roof. And there was a hurricane of fire going on the outside of this of this house, and this house is tumbling like tumbleweeds. And uh, there was uh, these creatures in the room. And one was like uh, a gargoyle type looking one. That's the only one I really remembered because he was the biggest one, and, and uh, I was really focused on him. But there was uh, these other little ones, and. Uh, 
uh, there was this lady levitating on an altar. And she uh, was wearing black sackcloth. And she had uh, missing pieces of white hair. She looked like she was maybe 150 years old. Mm. You know, very veiny. She was just levitating. And just looked like she was enjoying levitating. And uh, the main um, gargoyle demon, he was just perched there. And he pulled me without even touching me. He just didn't even touch me. Just pulled me. And I was remember digging my heels into the, into the floor, trying not to go. And uh, there's nothing I could do. And I, I, I didn't. I that was the first arms. time, though, that you actually felt resistance, right? Like, because you were, when you were, you knew the hate was there, and you knew uh, that your hope, that there was hopelessness there. But this is the first time where you're, you're really putting up a fight. Yeah, but the only thing I could do was, is, um, uh, I couldn't move my arms or anything, or walk or anything. I was just remember trying to dig my heels into the ground. I think that's all I remember. And then what happened next? Uh, they, they, they pulled me right up to her and then I woke up and then I woke up, you know, crying as you could imagine, you know, yes. <laughs> and, and just so thankful that I'm not really there. And, uh, then I told my psychologist and th this happened like maybe four or five years ago, told my psychologists and doctors what happened and, and they said, oh, it's just PTSD. Don't worry mm -hmm. about it. So I was like, okay. So it's a whole nother level of post-traumatic stress, right? There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's things that I could not, I, I've never studied hell. I've never, it was never an interest to me. Uh, um, I uh, don't watch movies, horror movies or anything mm. like that. So um, it was just knowledge that I could not, you know, imagine. Right. And so. Um, Do you find that you're in your ministry, you're talking to people that don't believe in it? Or are people afraid of it? What what are you finding when you're out there? No, in the ministry, um, at first, people, their eyes are just wide open. Right. Like, they're just like, oh, my gosh. And uh, then they, um, they hear the rest of the presentation. And I've had atheists walk in. I mean, every single atheist has walked in, has walked out non-atheist. That's after awesome. All the, yeah. Praise God. So, uh, so it's just, you know, when people open their mind and, and you know, just accept reality, you know, uh, um, it's just really amazing. But um, I don't know if I actually went to hell or if it was just a vision or a dr and I was in a dream because there's too much. Um, I mean, mm, can, yeah. have you ever had a dream that you remember everything? Uh, yes. Three years ago. That, <laughs> but that it's you, not a dream. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can tell you that, yeah, that, yeah. that you've actually felt. But you pain. can feel have everything. You ever, yeah. Yes, have you ever felt pain? Unfortunately, in the dream? No. Yeah. but not no. like that. Yeah, it wasn't so, a dream. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, there are visions, and there. Yeah. I believe that there's supernatural manifestations, and. Yeah. Um, so okay, so in your ministry, you're reaching a lot of atheists. If there's anything you could tell someone out there who's uh, not a believer right now or who has a lot of doubt, what would you say? Oh, what would I say? Uh, just do the research on um, on um, uh, flagellum motors. Learn things like irreducible complexity. You know. Uh, irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity. Um, I don't have the exact definition for it, but I know the term. You know. Uh, uh, they've used examples like if you take a mousetrap. Mousetrap has five different parts. If you take out um, one of these parts of the mousetrap, it won't work, it won't function. Right. And they've done, uh, 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 I think it was uh, Michael Behe, who's the one that, um, he's a professor, a uh, biologist, and, uh, or something like that. Uh, he, uh, he's the one that came up with that term, and actually he went to court um, to... Uh, he went to court for uh, um, because they were trying to take creation science out of the the school uh, system. So um, I don't really don't know. They're tearing up everything when yeah. it comes to uh, having the expression of God anywhere in the school systems. And now they're even taking the Pledge of Allegiance out of the school. So. Uh, for a long time, it was okay. We don't want to have God in anything. Now I just it's well. I won't, I won't say. Yeah, that. we can go on forever <laughs> about that. But uh, what I would say is just just look up um, uh, 
the actual evidence for it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, e even on our website, you know, there's things in there. Um, that how I know dot org. How I know dot org. Okay. Just uh, um, if it doesn't come up right away, how I know dot org, uh, Converse Texas. Okay. And before we go, tell us about your paintings. Uh, my paintings. Um, yeah, I it basically just started um, when I just want to hang some stuff up in my house. I didn't really want to pay for it, so um, uh, I had friends come over, and they just thought it was really neat stuff. And um, I was like, hey, you know, uh, they're wanting they're wanting it. I was like, well, you can buy it from me if you want. You know, I'm not gonna just get it. <laughs> right. And so uh, I experimented with that for a while to see if it was uh, worth investing in business cards and stuff and uh and it turned out it was and so uh now i i paint and uh and yeah so it's actually my wife's business so i'm just oh I'm just, okay she's just, yeah I'm just, she's an art dealer i'm just the um i just i'm her employee <laughs> there you go well okay well which is your favorite uh my favorite one is uh if there is one, because I'm sure there's many. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, let's see which one's over here. I think my favorite one is the pelican. Really? That's my favorite one. Like, I held on to that one for so long. Uh, no one ever really wanted it. And uh, I couldn't understand why. It's just, I couldn't believe I, I, uh, I did that. <laughs> it's beautiful. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people like the... Um, um, the palm tree one, that, no, not that one. That's cool too. <laughs> They're all beautiful. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I don't really have a favorite. I was talking about the purple palm tree. The, On the yeah, the, the. yeah, it's a pretty sky. Looks like a. It's one of my favorite ones. I enjoy doing, done that one twice. Uh, so if people want to purchase, do they go to your website? Yeah, they can go to the website, give us a call, and uh, um, you know we're trying to set that up. We're still learning as we go. You know, we're we didn't take any business classes or anything, so we're just learning as we go. But you know, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. Okay, so if they're gonna reach you, they can get you there at three six one two zero seven twenty five ninety nine. Yes. And you and your wife work as a team, too, in the ministry. Yes. So if they want to see more about what you're doing and have any questions maybe about uh, faith, yes. they could reach you there. Yeah, too. They, yeah they, could, they could call us. Uh, uh, we, we just really enjoy, we, we would really almost beg uh, to have a presentation uh, at, if you're a pastor, mm -hmm. um, to give us a call uh, and see what we could do. Um, Anywhere in the country, like as long as they pay for the gas. No limits, right? <laughs> yeah, we uh, we don't charge anything, and uh, we just we just want to share Jesus' love as much as we can. And so, who inspired you to become a painter? Uh, I think uh, watching my mom uh, as I was I was probably like um, probably like maybe five or six, and she was making templates because she would make these um, puppets and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just watched her draw. And uh, then my dad has this um, this um, drawing that he did in pencil. And it's it's a mother with her baby. And um, I asked him, who, who did that? He's like, I did. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I um, got these artist parents, you know. So. Right. So you're genetically predisposed so, yeah, to so I guess artistry. It's genetic, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I just, I just started to ever since I was really young. And uh, it was Picasso who said that. Um, I'm not too sure, but I think it was him. He said that every child is an artist, but the trick is to, um, to carry that on into adulthood. Right, and so your uh, mom and dad encouraged you, obviously. Uh, well, yeah, uh, somewhat. Um, in Alice, it's all oil filled and and raising cattle, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that I mean, it wasn't going to pay the bills or anything. Uh, but um, 
I, I, my mom has this book and it has like all the things that I've done my whole life. And she puts those out when I have a presentation or something. You know, when she's involved, she'll make sure she puts that out. And, um, and, uh, I forgot where I was going with that. Well, where, how, how did your style develop? What, oh, what yeah. Did you well, I don't know. I just, I just started off, um, uh, with this simple little abstract design and then, and then just got better and better, just kept on doing it and haven't got to hold on to any of my art since because everyone buys it. Well, um, there you go. Yeah. So which one was your first? Is there one that's up there? That uh, that was, those are one of my first ones, those mermaids. Uh, that's actually one of my first ones, yeah. Hmm. And uh, that's, yeah, my very first one. I notice there's a lot of sky and nature in uh -huh. your art. Is it divinely inspired? Is there something about it that? Mm, I, I think I just like trees. All right. I just like trees. <laughs> I like trees. I like all kinds of trees. And uh, I like what they do. You know, they, 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 they build us houses, mm -hmm. pencils, tables. You know, they, they house birds and feed. You know, this is the greatest invention God did, you know, was a tree. And they're in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, sure. Thank you. You can check out Mario's paintings at paintingsbymariolopez.com. Go there, email him, contact him there, or you can also go to his website, his ministry website, howiknow.org. That's howiknow.org. And find out more about the ministry that he and his wife have together going around telling the world the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm Gigi Arnetta for the InfoWars Nightly News. And thank you, Mario, for your incredible testimony. Now, last year about this time, there was a TSA opt-out and film campaign. But this year, InfoWars is running something very special. It's called We Will Resist TSA and NSA Tyranny, a $10,000 film contest. Now, be sure to get your entries in. You have till the beginning of the year to get those in. You can see the full list of rules and details on InfoWars.com. And if you win that, you will be a very grateful person, not only for the money, but also to bring awareness to the situations happening, not only in our airport. We have the TSA Viper teams. These guys are spreading out. They're going to Super Bowls. They're going to presidential inaugurations and all kinds of things. So it's not just in your airport. You can't stay out of the airport and ignore this. You need to fight it on every front, and this is a great way to do it. And you may just end up with something to be very thankful for. Well, I'm Jakari Jackson for the InfoWars Nightly News, and we'll see you again on Monday. This is a conspiracy by the technocrats, by the ruling elite, by the eugenicists that want to dumb us down. This is the Iodine Conspiracy. Our government wasn't always a eugenicist-based predatory group. Back in the 1920s, the federal government pressured salt manufacturers and bread producers to add iodine because they knew that iodine deficiencies were causing massive decreases in IQ, birth defects, and it was a health crisis all across the United States and in Europe as well. In the decade after iodine was added to staple foods, there was a 15 point increase in IQs in the areas that had previously been deficient. So what did the federal government do a couple decades later? They took the good halogen iodine out and added another bad one, bromine. And they put the worst of the group, fluoride and fluorine derivatives, in our water supply and began using it as a pesticide on the crops. Let's be clear about this. Adding bromine to the food supply is banned in the EU, banned in Canada, and banned in many other nations because it is a toxic poison listed in those countries. I've done deep research on the globalist program to dumb down the population to make us more manageable. It is eugenics. And I personally take the highest quality form of unbound iodine, nascent iodine, in a kosher certified, non-GMO certified glycerin base. I've interviewed the experts, people like Dr. Brownstein and pharmacist Ben Fuchs, and of course, Dr. Edward Group, and across the board, the consensus is iodine is the missing piece of the puzzle. 
and not just iodine, but high quality, unbound, pure iodine. Bottom line, this is something on record our bodies need. I've gone out and found the best source for myself and my family. I hope you'll visit InfoWarsLife.com and get our InfoWars Life Survival Shield. It really does incredible things. And we've got nothing but positive reviews from our listeners. And this also helps support our news operation and the info war while we get the iodine we need and block the fluoride and the other members of the halogen that are so bad for our bodies. Check out the information. Do the research for yourself. Talk to your physician and then decide whether you want to drink fluoridated water that Harvard major studies admits is giving people brain cancer and bone cancer and lowering their IQ or whether you want to find a high quality source of iodine. Consult your physician, do your research, and make a decision. But whatever you do, don't just ignore this message because all of my research shows this is absolutely key to getting people out of the brain fog that they've been artificially put into by the social engineers. Visit InfoWarsLife.com today. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at InfoWars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at InfoWars.com slash show.